Welcome to Eye on America. I'm Michelle Miller. Fighting to end veteran homelessness, helping refugees settle, and saving our nation's majestic birds. We travel across the country to share the stories of those stepping up and making an impact in their communities. Our first stop, the Midwest, where some farmers are under extreme pressure to survive. But Jonathan Vigliotti shows us how a new hotline is becoming a lifeline. Most of Dexter, Iowa's main street is closed for good. So you've got one, two, three, four, five. That's the emptying out of rural Iowa is this square mile by square mile. Fourth generation farmer Barb Callback keeps track. So we're going to take this car right here on her drive to her husband Jim's workshop. There was a house there for years and a barn and feedlots and stuff. There was a family named Leniker that were big farmers. There used to be a house there too. It's the aftermath, she says, of around 90% of small farms in the area <laughs> shuddering, unable to survive shrinking profits, climate change, and corporate farming. The callbacks are one of only a handful of family farms left here. Last 20 years has been terrible. Oh, you got to be great big or you just as well forget it. 500 acres won't do it anymore. You just as well have 5,000. Many of those who remain are barely holding on. First call to one mobile crisis. Which is why the Minnesota Department of Agriculture has launched a hotline to help. How many calls are you and the team fielding every single day? We field about 30,000 a year. Some of the farmers call in the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning in their tractor trying to get the tilling done because they know seeding has to happen. Can you just talk to me? Can you help keep me awake? The most urgent calls are directed to Ted Matthews. He once led FEMA's mental health response. When you get that first call from a new farmer, what do they say to you? The first call, they're very timid. Um, they're not sure whether they should have called. It's overwhelming how difficult things are in farming. There is not a minute where a farmer doesn't feel stressed. There's something always going on that could go wrong. According to the CDC, farmer suicide rates spiked 40% in less than two decades. In Minnesota, Matthew says that number has started to drop as more farmers call and connect. This idea that you have to get so bad in order to see a therapist is, is a foolish one. Why wouldn't you want to be healthier? Thank you for calling the Minnesota Farm and Rural Helpline. How An essential you? lifeline in America's heartland. We now turn to our nation's veterans. In January 2020, more than 37,000 former military members experienced homelessness in the United States. But in Los Angeles, Tiny shelters are making a big difference by helping our nation's heroes with a fresh start. Joy Benedict has their story. The west side of Los Angeles is known for giant waving flags and patriotism. But nestled behind the gates of the Veterans Affairs compound, it is the smallest of symbols that seem to have the biggest impact on those who served. Mine is down here. Michael Shea is homeless or at least he was. Um, that's a parachute rigger, and then those are my airborne wings. He was proud to show off his first home in almost a year, a tiny structure built on the lawn of the Los Angeles VA. It's not a car door, it's not, you know, it's actual, it's a door. And there are rows of doors. This is CTRS, Care Treatment Rehabilitation Services, the only tiny home village in the nation run by the VA and reserved for homeless veterans. Thought that this would be the best avenue to getting back to that, you know, forever home. And he's not alone. There are an estimated 40,000 homeless veterans nationwide. So when the pandemic shut down group shelters and tents displaying the stars and stripes started showing up outside the gates, this program was born. A tent city, then tiny shelters, all of which are donated. We had a lot of homeless veterans, but we needed a place to put them. Shannon Santini runs the program. 
In the last four months, she has seen donations come in from local schools, local businesses, even former Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's really heartwarming to be able to offer a, a pallet shelter to someone versus a tent. So it's really wonderful. But it's also very sad when you think about how much need there is here in this community. Veterans right now are coming here from all across the country saying, oh, we saw that you have this pallet shelter. Can we come to it? But this is just the beginning. Five years since I had my own place, five, six years. Warren Miller moved into one of the first tiny shelters in October. A few weeks ago, come into my little humble abode. He unlocked the door to a real home. I love the smile you're wearing these days. Thank you. I got something to smile about. <laughs> and although Shay is just thankful for his tiny shelter, he's starting to realize he deserves more. You know, the longer I became homeless, the more undeserving I felt. So the more times I closed that door, the more I started to feel I deserved a home. Not just a door, a gateway to a fresh start and hopefully a home for all who served. Yeah. Feels good. Feels good. Coming up, it's been described as the most diverse square mile in America. We'll take you to a small town in the southern U.S. that's become a home to refugees from around the world. You're watching Eye on America. More than 76,000 Afghan refugees have been resettled by the U.S. after the American military withdrew from Afghanistan last summer. In a city that's dubbed the Ellis Island of the South, CBS Saturday Morning co-host Dana Jacobson spoke with some of them who found a home away from home. How difficult was it to leave Afghanistan for you? We spent our whole life in Afghanistan. No? We had friends there, our whole family were there. As 20-year-old Aziz walked in his new neighborhood in suburban Atlanta, he reflected on his journey there. In less than six months, your whole life has changed. Yeah, totally. We started from zero here now. You understand why your dad wanted to leave, though? Uh, yeah, actually, his life was in danger and everyone's around him. Last August, Aziz fled Afghanistan with his parents and siblings. His dad, a journalist, asked to be identified simply as Ahmed and that his identity be concealed, fearing for his family still in Afghanistan. He's been named on more than one Taliban hit list. In the one list was 100 people. Most of them were journalists, social activists, government spokespersons. In both lists, the second list was of 40 people. Both lists, my name was in that list and I was scared a lot. But it took Kabul's collapse for Ahmed to leave his home. He reached out to friends from NATO conferences he'd attended over the years. U.S. Special Forces helicoptered Ahmed, his wife, and kids over this chaotic scene into the Kabul airport. They were eventually flown out of the country. These brave men and women and children from Afghanistan, like you see behind us, have left their entire lives behind. After several months living at different U.S. military bases, the family of six now has a home. This three-bedroom house in Clarkston, Georgia. So in this street, most of people are from the East Asian countries. Myanmar, Nepal, India, Pakistan, and the uh, Philippines and also Muslims from Somalia, other African countries. So I really like this diversity and uh, knowing new people from new, new countries. Clarkston is known as Ellis Island of the South. 53% of the population was born outside of the U.S. and 60 languages are spoken in the city's one square mile. Unfortunately, it's not changing. It means that the more refugees they are, that means the more conflict where they're coming from. Amy Zangandu is the director of Refugee and Immigrant Services at Inspiritus. The Atlanta-based nonprofit resettled Ahmed's family and thousands of others since 1981. Zangandu herself is a refugee. She fled from the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. What is so special about Clarkston? We have housing partners that we're willing to, to 
be ready and work with us. The location is accessible to public transportation. We have English classes and we have families that have been here for a long time that has established ethnic restaurants and, and grocery stores. It's a welcoming city and it's been that way for a very, very long time. Inspiritus has resettled more than 600 Afghan refugees alone in the last three months. The nonprofit had settled just 74 total refugees in 2020, forced to downsize during the Trump administration, which capped refugee admissions in fiscal year 2020 at 18,000, lowest number since Congress passed the 1980 Refugee Act. So we're still hiring, we're still looking for resources, we're still gathering communities and partner with us before they want to try to bring back. It's not just the refugees in Clarkston who benefit from the town's open arms. The refugee community, we're not doing it for them. They don't need us to do that. We're doing it with them. How's your coffee? Delicious. <laughs> Georgia native Kitty Murray launched Refuge Coffee in 2017. The nonprofit has hired and trained 50 people from over 17 countries, including her first hire, Leon Shamdana, who fled the Congo 10 years ago. Refugee coffee, when we started, even today, we are like uh, people from the big family. You know, I can put it like uh, there's a people from a big family, different mother, but one father. <laughs> <laughs> that is refugee coffee. Shombana is now a customer service coordinator and helps run this food pantry for the community. Living in Claxton, it helped us to understand how life goes on, have a picture, how life goes on in Syria without being there. It's giving you the chance to, to have an idea how life goes on in Eritrea without being there. We are multicultural, as I said, and then different background, but all of us, we are here. So it gives us like the way to see the things, even though you are never be there. Clarkston prides itself in being about the long welcome for residents like Shombana, who came and never left. It all starts like it has for Ahmed and his family, with a place that's home in more than just the name. Has it helped here in Clarkston? There are so many refugees. Yeah. Has that made a difference? Uh, a lot. Uh, it gets a little bit easy to adjust with people which have same culture with you. Yeah. As sometimes the same religion, you know. So, yeah, when you are surrounded by people from different places who, who are already spent there sometimes as a refugee, yeah. so it gets a little easy. Now we are starting our new life in new country, in new culture, new law. Everything is new, and everything we are beginning from the zero. The people are very loving. Uh, they brought all these things the furniture, the beds, the mattress, the kitchen, appliances, all they're helping us a lot and we are very thankful to them. There is a lot of Afghan families here in this area and the good thing is the mosque is very near. It is 100 meters walk. My mother was always praying for me that you should find a house near to mosque. So You did? Yeah, I did it. Now life is getting normal a little step by step. More than 28 billion glass bottles and jars end up in landfills every year. That's two times the size of the Empire State Building filling up every three weeks. But last July, Jesse Mitchell met two women in Louisiana who found a sustainable and profitable solution to reduce, reuse, and recycle. They're on the grind here in Scott, Louisiana. And now it's gonna get a little loud. Tina Crapsey and her partner, Don Vincent, are crushing it. <laughs> crushing glass. When they stopped recycling glass, it just didn't make any sense to me to throw it in the garbage. A metal worker by trade, Crapsey spent months of trial and error to produce her own solution, the Annihilator. And make a batch. We can crush nine wine bottles in about six seconds. Five years ago, the local government ended its glass recycling program, in part because the newer machines could not sort glass without contamination from food and other recyclable items. 
Even though recycling has increased across the country, glass recycling has decreased over the past decade. I can see how challenging it would be on a larger scale because it's pretty challenging on even just the small scale. The glass recycling process can be slow. Bottles soak for days to loosen labels for a clean slate. It's tedious, huh? It is. We make it fun, though. Yeah, we do. How do you do that? We have friends over. <laughs> and we have yeah. drinks. <laughs> You're contributing to the pile? Yes. <laughs> then the selection for the perfect blend. It looks good. It's like painting. The finished product, a sparkling mulch that is safe for landscaping. Their signature color, Backyard Sapphire, the company's namesake. We sip that out, and then we get the, the pebble blend. And then some of the large pieces end up in our uh, beach glass. The mulch stays put and filters water as it rains, solving two problems with one simple idea, an idea that has earned the couple praise from environmental regulators across the state. We've actually got a Louisiana weatherproof uh, landscaping yeah. that, that might make it through a storm. And make others see the beauty of recycling. Heads up, the bald eagle is making an urban comeback in the concrete jungle. This is Eye on America. America's national bird is on the brink of extinction due to environmental factors such as pollution and pesticides. But a recovery effort is helping bald eagles soar back to New York City. Here's Michael George. They're majestic, fierce, and America's national bird. They'll just glide right over your head sometimes, and it's just such an amazing feeling. But lately, bald eagles have been turning up in the unlikeliest of places. New York City. In January, bystanders in Central Park were awestruck when they witnessed a bald eagle, nicknamed Rover, catch a gull in mid-flight. Eventually, they're going to start to nest here and live here full time. Rob Mastriani is a New York City Urban Park Rangers sergeant. Plenty of open space for them to hunt. He's been part of a more than 20 year effort to bring the bald eagles back to New York. The birds used to be plentiful here, but pollution of the city's rivers and the pesticide DDT brought them to the brink of extinction. What happened was the eggshells got really thin from this pesticide. The eggs would break and they weren't reproducing. How dire did things get for the bald eagles here? Basically, they were almost extinct from New York State. Starting in 2001, the Parks Department relocated 20 fledgling eagles from Alaska and Wisconsin to Manhattan's Inwood Hill Park. That's Rob back in 2006 feeding the baby eagles. So we would climb up a ladder, it's about 40, 50 feet, and there was a little opening on the nest box where we'd slide the fish in. So it would be like an invisible mom or dad bringing them food. The U.S. government banned the use of DDT in 1972. And in recent years, more funding and resources have been put toward cleaning up New York's rivers. Now, the eagles are thriving. The babies Rob helped raise have families and nests of their own and have migrated to other areas. You've been involved with these eagles for 16 years now. Yeah. Do you develop a personal connection with them? On one of my days off, I went over to visit the nest, to have my binoculars, and it was a great feeling on the seat her, um, with her family raising her young. So I kind of felt like a proud parent, <laughs> foster parent. <laughs> in the 70s, there were believed to be just two bald eagles left in the entire state of New York. Now, there are well over a thousand, and they're no longer considered endangered. They've been spotted in all five boroughs of New York City. You think we have a shot at seeing some bald eagles today? I hope so. Fingers crossed, yeah. So if you're lucky enough, on a cold morning along the Hudson River, you just may spot one, commuting on an ice floe. What are they hunting for out here? Um, out here, they love fish, so um, they're going for fish. That's their preferred prey. And as beautiful as these birds are to see in the sky, that's nothing compared to seeing one up close. This is Montana. He's a 12-year-old adult male bald eagle. Bobby Horvath is a wildlife rehabilitator. We rescued him, and unfortunately, when we picked him up, he had a broken right wing, broken right leg, and he's blind in his right eye. But surviving in a major metropolis presents its own set of challenges. One eagle was killed by a Metro North train. And in February, Horvath rescued this fledgling. 
His wings were tangled in a fishing line. He had surgery this week, and uh, we won't know for a couple months if that bird is going to be uh, fully recovered. The eagle's greatest threat is us. The locations of their nests are shrouded in secrecy to prevent curious crowds from gathering close by. What can we do to protect them? Appreciate them and enjoy them, but just give them their space. We came close to losing these birds forever, but now they're becoming our neighbors once again. A poolside program is on a mission to teach children with special needs the physical and emotional benefits of swimming. Janet Chamlian treads the waters to see how these swim lessons in Nashville are changing lives. Two, one, go! On the surface, they're just swim lessons. But in each lane of this pool, a life is changing. Big arms, Grant. He just loves it, and he gets so excited. Good job. Andrew. Laura Marshall says her 18-year-old son, Grant, is nonverbal and severely autistic. In the water, he's an athlete tasting success. <laughs> it's just something you never thought would happen, and it's happening. These are the Nashville Dolphins, people with a variety of challenges, learning to swim and swimming competitively. Brenda Vroon runs the program. The families of these children are used to hearing no, mm -hmm. and they can't. Yes. But you tell them something else. We tell them that they can, and we know they can. Just to see the things that they can do, it's really amazing. High five. More than Good 100 job, volunteers buddy. teach for free, helping families often financially burdened with multiple therapies and doctors. <laughs> for swimmers like Grant, an experience for which there is no price. It gives them a sense of normalcy. It gives them peers and friends. What does it give you? It sure gives me joy. Coming for a life-saving skill, staying for so much more. Yeah. Yeah. For more stories like these and live coverage of breaking news 24-7, stream us right here on CBS News, available across all platforms. I'm Michelle Miller. Thank you for watching. Hi on America.